So I just got home from testing out the Vision Pro and the thing that stood out to me was the immersive video. So you know I had to check out some videos of it. My first impression was that it wasn't really for games, but for animation and film, it is perfect. Hmm. So I thought to myself, and then I had the idea. What if I took the animations that I made in Unity and I port them over to the Vision Pro for immersive video? And that's exactly what I did. I got my computer, I started playing around with different things, and then I was able to create some interesting experiences that I got to sit down in my living room and actually check out in real life. Since I designed a cardboard headset called Analog AR, all I needed was my phone. I just popped that into the actual headset, put it on my face, and the hands-free experience, much like the Vision Pro for immersive video, was at the tip of my fingertips. It was a great experience for sure, and then I definitely took it outside so that I can test it out in the actual real world. The best way I could think about it is taking the immersive world and putting it in the real world to make the real world even more immersive. You know, it's sort of a, a layer upon layer type of thing. And that's what I do as a creator, and I was able to do that with this project as well. The Vision Pro just released, and one of the big things that they were talking about was that it allows for you to do spatial video and or immersive video. And they keep talking about like spatial computing and stuff like that as well. But as an animator, as a visual storyteller, as somebody that works in video and compositing and all that stuff, I was excited. I was really excited about what was possible with the Vision Pro for film and, you know, production and stuff like that. As an AR developer, you know, somebody that is published in VR, years of experience working in AR, um, I was not sold. I was not sold. And a lot of the people that have been, you know, that are more in the industry, uh, particularly in the spaces that I operate and some of my friends, they were very much underwhelmed uh, to the point where I was surprised. I was super surprised that they were taking it so hard because for me, you know, the way I describe it, because mind you, it was a, it was a really, I would say, you know, I, I did the demo at the Apple store. You know, I got the full experience of what it can do and, and can't do. And I also got to bear witness to somebody that uh, actually bought it. You know, one of my friends got the one terabyte version of it. And I am super curious how that's just going to translate, you know, over time. But he he was super excited about it. He was showing us and I got tons of videos of it. And, you know, it's great for like seeing like a customer, like an actual customer, like see it and stuff like that, which is great. But, but I will say that the way I describe what the Vision Pro is to me um, is a 3D Blu-ray player that you can control with your eyes. That That's, that's how I would describe it. I think that the meta quest in terms of the versatility and what it can offer i think that the meta quest is better i think that if you do have three four thousand dollars essentially you need four thousand dollars with taxes and you get the you know the insurance and all that stuff you know you're leaving the apple store at least spending four thousand dollars right so for four thousand dollars does that constitute me being able to do a lot of different things with it that i normally would with my phone um, I don't know. I, I, I don't think so. Uh, it's new. It, it's a new experience. And I think that my favorite part was the immersive video, like the demo that they showed at the end. It was amazing. Uh, hands down. It was an amazing, uh, display of what you can do with spatial video and immersive video. Um, and so what I wanted to do was try to figure out the, what the possibilities were for an animator like myself, I don't, I use Unity. I, I kind of use Unreal, not really, but like I use Unity. I work in 2D and 3D animation and I am able to display that on screens and I do that in augmented reality and I integrate that into comics, right? So can I use the Vision Pro for comics? No, like it just, there's SDK issues, all that stuff, right? Do I think it'll be the best thing for like print media to translate things and bring things to life as if they were really there off a of screen. Perfect, perfect form factor, everything else. Will they do that? Not at all. Like I, I do not foresee them doing that, but when it comes to 
uh, reshaping what animation can do and how it can be experienced, uh, and even video in that matter, like, you know, having volumetric captures and all that stuff and being able to create a level of depth and, immers and immersion with the, uh, the headsets and stuff like that uh, and have that be available on streaming platforms. Uh, I think that the Vision Pro, my humble opinion, I think that the Vision Pro is a great, it is a, a great alternative to going to a movie theater. It is a great way to experience uh, streaming uh, in a very personal way. I don't think that it allows you to share experiences. It's a very personal thing for how much it how much it costs. Very much like every other VR stuff. Like it, it's it's like a roller coaster that you have at your house, right? Like it, it's um, you know, it, it's it's very good for that. Uh, great for you know working. Uh, but I know that. You don't want to be working all day. And so I think it goes beyond that. Uh, I'm a, you know, I will spend $2,000 on a Wacom Cintiq. I don't think I would spend $4,000 on a headset. That's just me. I will spend $2,000 on a mocap suit. I won't spend three, $4,000 on a headset. That That's just, just to, just to do what I can normally do with my phone or whatever. Um, in, a, in one way, shape, or form, right? So I digress. I, I've always had this idea and, you know, last week or the past couple of weeks, I've been really trying to get into uh, the high definition render pipeline with Unity and with the high definition render pipeline, it allows you to do comparable stuff to uh, what I would call like unreal quality, like high fidelity. Uh, out of the box, you could get close to that um, with lighting and all that stuff. And because I have characters, I'm incorporating that into comics. I want to do more high fidelity stuff and I want to do it for me cheaper and quicker. I'm able to do that using the high definition render pipeline. And the best part about it is the stuff that I do for comics, I can actually pour it over to animation. And so I wanted to take the animated shorts that I made uh, based off of the comics that I was making and I wanted to see how that translated to augmented reality. And when I say augmented reality, I'm talking about mobile augmented reality with smartphones, because let's just be frank here, the mobile augmented reality experiences or the mobile experiences, the XR experiences as a whole are mainly built on Android devices, on the Android operating system. And so for people that say, oh, where is Google at? Why aren't they in the XR game? Well, the MetaQuest operates with Android. It's a, it's a modified version of Android. Obviously all Android devices, modified version of Android. Even iPhones have AR Core, which is Google's AR SDK. And so everything is kind of running on Android at this point. And so to be frank here, you know, for people talking about mobile AR isn't the future, it might not be the future, but it's definitely the present and it's definitely the past. And so for people to talk bad about mobile AR and saying that headsets are better, even though headsets are using, they're mobile. That's, you know, for to be frank here, they're mobile, they have the same sensors, they have the same, you know, like they have the same limitations as smartphones, but smartphones are a lot more accessible. And if we talk about it, you know, you can get the analog AR augmented reality headset, and that will allow us to do a lot with our smartphone that is comparable to a headset. That, that's, that's it. And so because of that, I had two, essentially three demos that I worked on. And because I'm using high definition render pipeline with Unity, I wanted to see if I could take those things that I have as characters, uh, create little animated shorts with them. And then from those animated shorts, be able to port those over into the universal render pipeline so that they could be rendered in AR on a mobile device. Uh, 
using high definition render pipeline for mobile AR just doesn't work. It's too high fidelity. It's the whole reason why the Unreal Engine just does not work for mobile AR. And for anybody that has tried that, they know the issues, right? And so I thought it was going to be a smooth transition, which I think Unity has a lot of work to do to move from universal render pipeline to high definition render pipeline and vice versa. But in, in essentially the first half of like porting it over is just trying to deal with the pink materials that you get inundated with, with porting over something from high definition to the universal render pipeline. After you get over, over that with all the issues with the shaders and the materials, then you're able to essentially drag and drop the players in and do all that stuff. And it, and it works out, right? Like the, the animation is still there. The visual effects are still there. All the assets are still there. It's just that the materials and the shaders are just completely trashed. Like that, that's really the, the hardest part about it. Obviously you're going to want to move it over to a universal render pipeline project opposed to switching from high definition render pipeline, render pipeline assets to universal render pipeline, pipeline assets. You don't want to do that just because it messes up your whole project. You're better off just having two different projects and then porting assets over using the export package feature. Just save yourself the hassle. It's it's not worth it with that. But when it comes down to it, you know, once you have the materials and the shaders all set, uh, you can essentially just press play, right? And that's uh, that was what I was expecting going into it, which was really, really great. But when you're looking at something in the editor and you're looking at something in AR, you quickly understand that having freedom is not really your best friend, especially when it comes to having freedom with a camera. That you're able to change the different camera angles on the fly and all that, and you're giving the user full use of the camera to, to control that experience, but it comes at a cost. And that cost is very, very much the reality that animation and video is kind of smoke and mirrors. It's like having a magician and the magician controls the experience that the audience sees. But when the magician gives the secrets or just opens up and has, is a lot more transparent, then there's a lot of imperfections that uh, the artists are able to cover up. And that becomes very apparent in the the demos that I did because I'm not able to control the camera angles. And so it changes the way I would approach experiences in general. Uh, and because it was such a, I was able to take a step back from the camera and view it from a 10,000 feet view, it was very clear that my approach to animation has to change if I want to translate it to immersive video, opposed to just regular video on a, on a screen. Because you don't get the camera angles that you want, because it's just sort of looking as a spectator. You don't get the camera angles, and you also don't get to have as much of a control over the feeling that you get with like slow motion and stuff. And so with a lot of the demos, specifically the first one, you know, after I, after I ported over the stuff and got it set up on the Unity timeline and in a universal render pipeline scene from HD re render pipeline, then I decided to add the Vuforia SDK because that's probably the best SDK that will work outside of the box. And it allowed me to test in the editor before I hit build because I wasn't sure if it was going to actually build or not. And then after I did that, I was able to um, connect everything for the surface tracking 
And I didn't do any UI or anything because I just wanted to test out the experience, just the raw experience in camera. Uh, and I ended up just doing that outside in the parking lot of my, uh, my condo complex and stuff. And so I'm just walking around, you know, I get the scope of the land and then I'm able to look over and place the actual experience and voila, you know, I was able to put the characters in there and they were able to, you know, play out the animations. And for the first part of it, it was really great because uh, you could clearly see it's just, you know, two characters arguing. I could have put like a fake shadow to like really implant the make it a little bit more believable, but it's like looking from the outside in, you're able to see both characters. You can hone in on one character or another and having those different shots and that experience is interesting. When it came to the actual effects, that's when it actually started to fall apart because, you know, the like regular fight scene was great. It was great until you had to reset the experience and then it just sort of like jolts back very much like a jump cut. But when it came to like the slow motion stuff, that's where it really, really like fell off and doing some of the like speed and anime effects and stuff like that. It just kind of looks weird in real life, but I think I could just, you know, put a little bit more time into that. But being able to like walk around the characters and, and be proxy to their different things, you know, their different uh, experiences and animations and stuff, you know, the, like I said, the, uh, the slow motion, just like, it just didn't really, it just wasn't really that great. The, the slow motion really didn't hit the way that I wanted it to. Um, and so the slow motion, I, I learned when you're looking from the outside in and you're far away from that, where the actual slow motion is happening, it just kind of falls short. And so I think that's something that I'm taking into consideration. It's like slow motion effects just don't really work uh, for this type of environment unless I'm like really up close with the ca with the camera. And I think I could do that with comics using like stencil buffers, but I can't do that with um, with just like spatial video where people have access to to controlling the camera and doing all that stuff. And so it, it's you know with with the when you break away from the limitations of, of film and animation. Uh, in video and you give more control to the user than like the bells and whistles and sort of like the the cool things that like you get from like a Zack Snyder film or like the super crazy action scenes and like those personal like slow motion effects and uh, stuff it just uh, it kind of falls flat and it, and it becomes really difficult to um, it becomes really difficult to re like capture that same essence in a in an easy port from a video to immersive video um, or traditional video to immersive video. And so, uh, and so with that, it, it was, it was a good experience. I, for how much time I put into porting it over, uh, it was a really good experience. And for the most part, all of these things were done relatively quickly because I think my workflow has gotten really, really good. The next video, I wanted to create an experience very much like a screensaver experience. Uh, for some reason, every time I started thinking about what I wanted to do for the Vision Pro, I kept thinking about like screensaver experiences, right? But when you did the demo, there is the ability to do the immersive video and really take the, the screen experience that like 2D screen experience that like the Vision Pro is just kind of iconic for at this point. And really wrap that around you as if you're being immersed in a completely 360 environment. You're escaping from the world that you're in and you are able to be immersed in a completely virtual world, but also have access to see your hands and, and there's occlusion and stuff like that. And so I wanted to recreate that and recreate that effect of it sort of immersing you uh, instead of just sort of implanting you in there, uh, like jarringly. I wanted it to like be very subtle. And so I was able to use a stencil buffer for that. And so it was really easy. Um, and, uh, and because the Unity Universal Render Pipeline samples are really, really good fidelity, I wanted to see how well that would translate to augmented reality, particularly with that full scene, how high fidelity it was, would I be able to capture that same level of immersion and quality 
in augmented reality at the same like fidelity as that. Can the universal render pipeline do that, and can it support it on a mobile phone? Because that that was the that was the big thing. If it's not supported on a mobile phone, then I have no reason to use it. So I really wanted to push the the device to see how how much it can do. What mind you, I have a Samsung Note Ultra Twenty Two, and so if it has the power to do that on that, then there's hope for it, especially with my headset and especially with all the other uh, things that I have. And so with this experience, I essentially created a, you know, a ball glowing up and then having it expand out and uh, it essentially immerses you in an oasis. And this oasis is using essentially the uh, universal render pipeline sample for the oasis. And I was able to walk around it. I was able to look around and just sort of look at the fidelity. And then after 15 or 20 seconds, it, it brings the experience back to that globe and it shrinks down and then you're back in the parking lot. And so that was one of the things that I wanted to do, but just being able to create that effect where it comes out of the ground and then it just, you know, glows and then it just explodes out and you're in this paradise and then being able to close that back in and then bring you back into the um the real world and have that be an experience that you could just download and have on your have on your phone it's it's really nice like it's a it's a really nice feature and i think that it just turned out really great uh for what i what i hoped to have with it and so the immersive video feature that that was that was it was a really good experience because compared to the animated stuff this is more of like if you have an opportunity to just take a little vacation and escape from wherever and put some headphones in, have some music, some tranquil music playing and to escape into an oasis that, uh, and all you need is a phone and a low cost headset, like the analog AR augmented reality headset, you know, for a fraction of it, you can have a very good meditation spot no matter where you're at. And, I think that that is one of the things that I think for me as an MD PhD student in integrative neuroscience, I think that that is a feature that I want to explore. And that is an area that I want to explore because for the most part, many of the avenues when it comes to medicine and uh, AR and VR are sort of wide open when it comes to the field of medicine. You know, as an MD, PhD student, I could attest to that because every time I go to class and every time I take a test and all this stuff, I think that, you know, my experience as an artist, as a as a as a developer uh, really lends itself to creating more immersive or just better experiences. Not even something that's more immersive, just something that is better than what is already available. And I think this really speaks to that. And so the, the Oasis demo was really, really fun because it allowed me to really take the stuff that I had and really see how well I could port it over and have it still maintain a decent level of quality. The, the same samples that I use within the Universal Render Pipeline uh, that works and is very, very good quality, uh, I could port those over to augmented reality very easily because it's meant for mobile devices. And so I think the universal render pipeline for as many of the flaws that it has, I think that it gives you an opportunity to really play around with the possibilities in a, in a way that makes sense because it, you just move the game objects to a, a surface tracking experience like you could with Vuforia. And from there you're able to, really build out the experience and add animation and visual effects like I did to make that experience even more sci-fi and surreal. And so with it, I could have added some sound to it to make it feel more ethereal, but I think that it, it served its purpose for what it needed to do in a relatively small amount of time. And so I essentially turned my, my parking lot and my house into an oasis using augmented reality. And that was, that's really fun. I thought that was really fun. So the last video that I did, or the last project that I did, was trying to take the 
uh, sort of like the Attack on Titan spoof video that I did where Roscoe is confronted with some uh, not so happy players and then they essentially bum rush him and he bites his arm and then he turns into a Titan and there's an explosion and stuff like that. I think that was like one of my favorite ones out of the series of videos that I did uh, when I animated them because I got to like play around with Titans and you know create different characters for it and stuff like that. And it, again, it was like a relatively short one uh, compared to a lot of the work that I do, but I think I want to do like more shorter uh, animated videos anyway. And I think when it comes to these, like, I think this one really loops very well. And so because it loops very well, it uh, was one that I was like looking forward to using for the port over into a more immersive or spatial video sort of experience. And so again, I, I brought it in and one of the things that became very apparent with it is with something that has explosions and stuff like that, you kind of have to be at a distance. Otherwise, at some point, you just see just a whole bunch of different just smoke just in your face for the, for the most part. And so this one, I would say, is like it lends itself to more distance, but it also lends itself to like just being improved a little bit more because I think that I didn't automatically loop this video. And so when it ended, it just kind of ended. But the thing that really stood out to me was the fact that in this video, I moved the cameras to certain areas, mainly because it was going to mask out certain aspects. And if it masked out certain aspects, then I could hide those blemishes in the, in the production, in the workflow. And that's not uncommon, like as a 2D animator, you're only animating the stuff that's on screen. If it's not on screen, you don't need to animate it, right? And so there's a lot of like, you know, half faces and half bodies and stuff like that that exist. I think with this one, certain aspects of the production really, really work. And to put things at scale, it allows you to place the characters in the real world and place them in the context I think when it came to this, there was a lot of space that you needed for this to actually look decent in the world with you. Like this wouldn't look great in my room or in my house, but it would look great in a parking lot because the parking lots are the things that uh, have a, a just an open space that's not gonna include things. And you're able to get farther away from the actual events that take place in the in it because there's a you know 30 foot titan that that explodes and then there's all this smoke and and dust that goes everywhere and there's lightning and everything and you in order for you to see all of that stuff you have to be at a distance and i think with the camera angles that i had the distance was really portrayed throughout the like the, the scope of the city when it comes to AR, like you can't really do that with this because you want to get up and close, but then in a split second, everything just like goes haywire and there's explosions everywhere. And so on the screen, all you're seeing is just like dust and smoke everywhere and you're not actually able to see what's hap actually happening. And so that's a limitation. And so what I found is that I was able to try to get at a certain distance and actually show uh, certain things, but I was kind of occluding different things as well. Like at the end of the actual animated thing, I didn't hide the one of the characters or I didn't have them laying on the ground or actually be affected by this explosion. And so once it actually finishes, all you see is just this character just like, just sort of floating in the air, just like right next to it. And so those are things you don't really like pay attention to when you have control over the camera. But once you don't have control over the camera, you're forced to reckon with all those little shortcuts that you made throughout the production. And you're forced to uh, really reassess how much actually translates from traditional video to immersive video. Because I could tell you that I didn't, when I, it wasn't until I actually saw the first couple of renders of the stuff in AR when I was demoing it out that I was like, huh. I didn't really pay attention to that. But now that I'm seeing that it's actually affecting 
how the experience is playing, I have to go back in, I have to go back in and fix it now. Right. And so I think this really speaks to the difference between a developer and an artist. You could say that there's an art to developing. Yeah. But like the, the developer in and of itself, you know, will get something to work. And then once it works, then the true development happens where you are trying to fine tune and debug and debug and debug and debug until it's how you, how you want it to be, or at least how you, how you need it to be, to be functional. Like, yeah, this works, but like, even though it works as a perfect loop, it doesn't really like work as an entertaining experience because there are so many limitations to how immersive video is. Right, because the way I would describe immersive video is based off of my experience as a user that was trying to, uh, that was introduced to, I guess, the buzzword topic or the keyword uh, through the Vision Pro experience. I was, I was like, this is great, this is amazing. But when it came to me actually taking videos or taking content and then trying to apply it to that for the for the form factor and for the that specific experience and try to recreate it i found that it was a lot more challenging than i anticipated it being it's not as challenging as animating once you have the animation uh, but like you will be tweaking it to where it is definitely taking on a life of its own and i didn't want to i didn't want to tweak this mainly because I wasn't at the liberty to just like sit there and animate stuff like that. I wanted to really just like develop and, and create it. But I will say that the evolution of this, you know, if this is going to be like a beta one of it in experience, you know, the evolution does come from the improvement after, after the port, because the port in and of itself is a feat, but being able to make it actually work is uh is another feat in its in and of itself and so i am truly curious to see how the areas of immersive video will translate to film and animation because i am not sold that the vision pro is going to be a industry disruptor of games and xr quote unquote i think it'll make xr as an industry, both AR and VR, I think it'll make XR uh, more of a household name because Apple has a device for it. But I also think that it will be kind of like a, it won't be as much of a blip as the MetaQuest Pro, which I feel came and then it left. It, it didn't stay for very long. And quite frankly, once people found out that the the Meta Quest 3 was coming out, nobody even cared about the Quest Pro. I think that the Vision Pro is going to last a lot longer than the comparable headsets, even though this one is kind of like the most expensive one at this point. I think there's another one, but like this one is pretty expensive. But I don't think that it outshines the Meta Quest 3 and what it has to offer especially at that price point. I think that hands down, the MetaQuest 3, based off of how the Vision Pro is, is the more sought after headset to me as a VR developer and an AR developer. And I think that I will use it more in my research for my PhD. But if I get my hands on a, on a Vision Pro, I'll have stuff to work with because I work with Unity, I have all the tools that I need, and I do a lot of the education stuff with Unity as well. And so it, it lends to more re it lends to more investigation, I would say, but it, it's not something that I'm not going to write it off, but I don't think that it is something that I need to really go too deep into. It's not something I'm gonna bank my career off of, for sure.
I think with being able to write about these things, being able to do demos and being able to uh, show what is possible with the technologies as an artist and a creator that has some developer experience, I think that is the lane that I operate in. And until I get my MD and my PhD as a, as a physician or a double doctor, um, you know, I'll continue to share those experiences with people that uh, are just so inclined. So with that, I, I was able to do three different demos of videos that I did in the high definition render pipeline. And then I ported those over to the universal render pipeline for use in augmented reality. And it was a success. And that's all I could say about it. It was, it was very much a success. I thought that it was going to break my phone. The, the APK files were around 250 to 300 megabytes, which are significantly higher than what I'm normally used to, but it worked. And that's the, uh, that's the thing that I appreciate about it is that it worked. It worked very well. So I hope to do more stuff with it. And if you're so inclined, check out my work with Island Fever, check out my virtual reality book that I did with Pact Publishing, which is Enhancing Virtual Reality Experiences with Uni Unity 2022. And check out my low cost augmented reality headset called Analog AR. And hopefully I'll continue to make interesting little experiences that allow you to do some interesting stuff with. So.